Tonight, an Alberta man recovering from a stroke finally thought he had a long-term care bed. But when he arrived, he was shocked. It was a terrible situation. How he wound up going from a hospital bed to a hotel with little care, a CBC News exclusive. Is buying an electric vehicle worth the money? It doesn't necessarily make sense for all households. New research crunches the numbers. Why the answer really depends on where you live. As the U.S. House moves to effectively ban TikTok. This time, it's serious. We break down whether it's really a national security threat and whether Canadians should be concerned. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansi. An Edmonton family is looking for answers tonight after their husband and father, who has complex medical needs, was discharged from hospital to an airport hotel. Partially paralyzed and relying on a wheelchair, he says he expected to go to long-term care, but instead he was sent by taxi to a hotel south of the city and checked into a hotel room. He says he wasn't given the care he needed, leaving him in a difficult state. This at a time when Alberta is under pressure to expand long-term care options to free up crowded hospital beds. He shared his story exclusively with our Julia Wong. For at least six months, Blair Caniff was stuck in an Edmonton hospital, hoping to get into a care home. Then he says a social worker told him he was moving. They just told me I was going to a facility for long-term care. Were you just told this is where you are being moved to? No list. This is where you were going. He says he was taken to a hotel south of the city. And what did you think when you first got there? <laughs> it was sort of a joke. Recovering from a stroke, Caniff uses a wheelchair and is paralyzed on his left side. He called his wife for help. I asked him, oh, is it all fixed up for uh, wheel wheelchair users? And he said, no, it's just like, I said, it's just like a motel. Has this travel lodge been turned into a long-term care facility? A hotel employee told CBC News, no, it was a hotel with rooms that anyone can book and that an organization had rented up to 10 rooms for several days. Caniff says a health care worker checked on him a few times a day, but he was otherwise on his own. I needed proper care, cleaning, being cleaned up and fed right. We were fed fast food. If something happens to his good arm, then he, you know, he, he would become totally helpless. Caniff says Contentment Social Services was the agency running the program at the hotel. CBC News texted, called and emailed the listed nonprofit multiple times, but no one responded. I've never heard of that happening in Alberta. This researcher who studies aging is shocked by the move. She says for patients with complex needs, a hotel stay could be dangerous. He could develop a bed sore. Uh, he could fall out of that wheelchair and break a hip, break an arm. Alberta is dealing with a growing aging population and hospitals are overcrowded, a problem acknowledged by the Premier this week. There's a percentage of, of patients with more complex needs who remain in hospitals much longer than necessary. No one from Alberta Health Services would speak on camera. In a statement, a spokesperson says different discharge options are considered for patients and AHS works to connect patients with community nonprofits following discharge. Caniff says he was sent back to hospital Monday with no explanation, one week after he arrived at the hotel. He's unclear what will happen next. It was a terrible situation. Julie, do we know of other cases like this in Alberta? So, Ian, I spoke with another patient who says he was also taken to a hotel after being in hospital. Now, AHS won't answer specific questions about whether a hotel is an appropriate place for a patient with high care needs, but it does say that care teams work with a patient and their family to prepare them for discharge. And options include lodges, emergency shelters, and short and long-term rentals. Julie Wong with our exclusive story in Edmonton. Boeing is now urging airlines to check the cockpit seat switches on all 787 Dreamliners after a sudden nosedive injured more than 50 people earlier this month. The Latam Airlines plane dropped suddenly on a flight from Australia to New Zealand, sending dozens flying around the cabin. The Wall Street Journal reporting a button on the captain's seat, which should be covered during the flight, was exposed and accidentally bumped. Boeing is recommending inspections as soon as possible. The FAA plans to review that guidance. 
and another incident involving a Boeing aircraft, this time a 737. The United Airlines flight made its way from San Francisco to Oregon today with a missing external panel. The issue not discovered until after landing, that lost panel has not been found. A judge in Georgia has ruled the district attorney on Donald Trump's election meddling case can stay on this after it was revealed she had a romantic relationship with a fellow prosecutor. As Paul Hunter explains, there'll be another delay in Trump's legal woes. You have a woman named corrupt Fonny Willis. Fonny. Fonny. Donald Trump mocks her relentlessly here at a campaign rally last weekend. I believe it's spelled F-A-N-I. To my way of thinking, that's Fanny. The indictment alleges... Fanny Willis, the Georgia I district attorney my... taking on the former president in court, accusing him of trying to overturn the 2020 election. It's the case that brought the world this mugshot of Trump. And these of the 18 others charged in the same case, four of whom have already pleaded guilty. Serious business for a lawyer. But last month, a bizarre and riveting sidebar. Willis herself bursting into a separate hearing on allegations against her brought by defense lawyers over this man. Nathan Wade, hired by Willis to be special prosecutor in the Trump case, but with whom Willis had had a romantic relationship. Defense lawyers wanted her gone, but Willis pushed back from the witness stand. Do you think I'm on trial? These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. Now, the presiding judge has ruled Willis can stay on, but only if that special prosecutor steps aside. After the ruling, Wade resigned from the case. The case itself proceeds. This is all about ensuring that when we look at this case and we look at how and when it proceeds to trial, that we feel confident in the process. But it likely pushes the trial itself further down the calendar. Indeed, all four criminal trials faced by Trump this year have met with delays. The big question now seems not whether any of the trials will have a verdict on Trump before the November election, but whether by then any of the trials will have even begun. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Emergency crews are assessing the damage and searching for survivors after a wave of tornadoes ripped across the Midwest United States. Jill English has more in this deadly start to the storm season. An ominous shape through the lightning as storm season ramps up in the U.S. Oh, no. Oh, no. All oh, those poor people. Tornadoes touch down across the Midwest and central states, from Indiana down to Texas. And by morning, the destruction was clear. Ohio emerged from the storm with at least three dead as first responders continued to comb through the wreckage. We're going to team up with cadaver dogs, fire and EMS, and law enforcement, and again go go door to door, so to speak. Dozens of people were injured. The damage widespread. The entire ceiling has caved in. The roof was ripped off the, the shopping center. I could feel the glass hitting me. Golf ball sized hail pounded the area and is still falling in Texas. These events have always occurred, uh, but their impacts are changing. The tornado! Yeah. Experts say the weather system isn't unusual for the region in March, but urban sprawl gives the storm more impact. The research to this point suggests that it's the exposure issue, the growing population and spreading of the population that is putting more things and more people in harm's way of these particular events. There's gonna be people here that are gonna have all kinds of needs. You know, many of them lost their homes. They've lost everything. Communities now go into the weekend cleaning up the damage and facing the loss, knowing they may need to brace for more. Tornado season is just beginning. Jill English, CBC News, Toronto. Ukrainian officials say two ballistic missiles struck a residential neighborhood in Odessa, killing at least 20 people, including two first responders. <laughs> a medic and another rescuer were dealing with the first strike when the second missile hit, killing them. Ukraine accuses Russia of near daily attacks on its cities, this one the deadliest in weeks. While Russia pursues its invasion, Vladimir Putin pursues his fifth term as president. 
But as Briar Stewart shows us, with many of his political opponents either excluded from the ballot, jailed or dead, the result of the election is almost certain. This is not the image the Kremlin wanted to see on election day, but just like other forms of dissent, this fire at a polling station was quickly snuffed out. There were a handful of protests across the country. Someone threw a Molotov cocktail at a polling station in St. Petersburg. This woman who dumped green ink into a ballot box is under investigation. Still, millions cast ballots, not only across Russia, but also in Ukrainian territories under its control. But everyone already knows what the outcome will be. The best president we've had since the Second World War. It's our President Putin, said this man. We don't expect anything good. Everything will be bad, said another. Three other names are on the ballot, but they're all Kremlin loyalists. Any meaningful opponent has been barred. Absent any kind of race, some of the polls looked more like a spectacle. In Siberia, a shaman performed a ritual blessing. At another polling station, voters could pose beside a cutout of Tucker Carlson, who interviewed Vladimir Putin last month. But close to Russia's border, officials accused Ukraine of shelling the area, killing at least one and trying to intimidate voters. These enemy strikes will not remain unpunished, Putin vowed. Now on track to win his fifth term as president. Hello, it's me. I'm president once again. Why bother? It is getting chilly in Moscow. Ivan Golitsyn lives in Moscow and talks about life in Russia on his YouTube channel. But he's now making plans to leave before Putin is inaugurated again. Again, so he can do whatever he wants. And, uh, you know, considering what's going on right now and considering that there's probably going to be another wave of mobilization, I don't want to be waiting here like last time I did. Voting will continue throughout the weekend. Supporters of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who died in an Arctic penal colony last month, are planning an act of protest. They're urging people to turn up at noon on Sunday. And if they want to vote, they're asking them to spoil their ballot or vote against them. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. For the first time since the war between Israel and Hamas began, a ship with food aid has reached Gaza's shores. But Sasha Petrasik shows us it offers only a glimmer of hope as the struggle to survive becomes more desperate by the day. Please continue along the agreed corridor route. Closely monitored by the Israeli military, food aid arrived in Gaza by boat for the first time since this latest war began. Only a modest 200 tons, but it came with the promise of more. I'll take it for my children, he says. They're dying of hunger. By air or land, desperation marks every aid shipment here. Overnight, it also brought death. More than 100 wounded and at least 21 killed at an aid line in Gaza City. That's according to the Hamas-run health ministry, which blamed Israeli soldiers. Israel says it was Hamas that attacked the crowd. Other times, it's been just chaos. Some people mm -hmm. say, well, aid is difficult to get in because there's desperation and chaos and violence. But it's the other way around. There's desperation, which breeds chaos and violence because there's not enough aid in. Many fear more violence if Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu goes ahead with plans to attack Rafah home to more than a million displaced Palestinians. He says he'll defy international pressure to refrain. We have to see a clear and implementable plan, not only to get uh, civilians out of harm's way, but also including sure warnings from Washington way, that just keep getting more blunt. And we've not yet seen such a plan. There's also mounting domestic pressure for a deal with Hamas, so Israeli hostages held in Gaza would be released in exchange for a pause in fighting. We can't leave them there. We just can't. This is our family. This is my blood, OK? Israel and Hamas have not been able to agree in months. But in a positive sign, Israel is now sending its negotiating team to Qatar to re-engage in talks brokered by Arab countries and the U.S. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News, Toronto.
One year after a massive fire killed seven people in old Montreal, grieving families and survivors are still looking for answers as the criminal investigation drags on with no charges laid. Sarah Levitt now with the growing anger and demands for accountability. Profound grief. Time hasn't healed the pain of their devastating loss. A year later, we still feel shock and disbelief that this has happened and our son has been taken from us. Shock over what happened last year in the early hours of March 16th. A fire broke out at a heritage building in Old Montreal, killing seven, including their son Nathan. He and five other victims were staying in illegal Airbnbs inside that building, which had been repeatedly flagged for fire safety violations. The accidental cause has now been ruled out. Police now believe the fire was deliberately set. Radio-Canada has learned the main suspect is a convicted killer who was on the lam at the time of the fire. But nobody has yet been charged in the case. I mean, how can that happen, Sarah? It's not only a you know, tragedy of human failure, but it's a comedy of errors. Randy and Beth Sears have since launched a lawsuit claiming the building's owner, the tenant running the short-term rentals, and Airbnb all played a role in what happened that morning. Others have joined the suit, including survivors. Probably the most lasting scar I think I have from that day is, is the survivor's guilt. Benjamin Majid managed to get out of the building in time. Now he feels much like Nathan's parents, frustrated. It just feels like such a juxtaposition of the immediate help that we received that morning versus the what feels like glacial pace of the investigation. Zafar Mahmoud, whose daughter Dania died that day, is also waiting for answers. A year has passed. Nothing has happened so far. And while the investigation continues, so does the grief. I just sit there and just close my eyes and think of the Danya is with me. And when the cool breeze blows, I think it's Danya's touch. While families of the victims are demanding accountability, Montreal police won't comment on the specifics of the case. But a lawyer involved in the lawsuit says Airbnb is negotiating a possible settlement. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. We're learning more about the state funeral for former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who died last month at the age of 84. Wayne Gretzky, Justin Trudeau and Pierre-Carl Pelleda will be among the speakers. Mulroney's daughter Caroline will deliver the eulogy. The service will take place at Montreal's Notre Dame Basilica on Saturday, March 23rd. Before the funeral, Mulroney will lie in state in Ottawa on Tuesday. Chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton will cover that for us alongside Power and Politics host David Cochran. It's a question on the minds of many Canadians as the country moves to reduce carbon emissions. How much will it cost to own an electric vehicle? There's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, electricity prices, gasoline prices. Why the answer may depend on where you live. Next. Plus, why small indie movie theaters are struggling to survive. I've just shut the doors and locked it up. The industry changes owners say are pushing them to the edge. And later, getting all dressed up for the park. Anything that we can do to try to recreate nature. A wildlife worker plays the role to help an orphan fox. We're back in two. McDonald's is apologizing for a widespread service outage that shut down some restaurants for about 12 hours today. The company blaming a third-party tech provider, saying this was not a cybersecurity issue. The outage had an impact on operations at restaurants around the world, including here in Canada. When you consider switching from a gas-powered vehicle to electric, you may weigh the cost of the vehicle against the savings in fuel. Well, now a new study is taking a closer look at the bottom line. As Lindsay Duncombe explains, it all depends on where you live and how much you drive. With three kids, a house in the suburbs and a job in the city, Bassam Javed drives a lot. I drive at least 100 kilometers a day. He wanted to find out if buying an electric vehicle would save him money, higher upfront cost, but no more gas bills. And, and then I figured that, you know, this is actually um, something that would be interesting for more people than just me. Because he's a PhD candidate and lecturer at UBC,
Javid turned his personal dilemma into a study, comparing the total cost of owning and operating an electric vehicle with its gas counterpart. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, electricity prices, gasoline prices, um, the, the amount of rebates. What he found was the cost calculation of owning an EV varies dramatically, depending on where you live in Canada and how much you drive. Costs are lowest in Quebec because it has the highest subsidies and cheapest electricity. EV drivers there would have to drive an average of 46 kilometres a day for seven years to break even, compared to a gas car. B.C. comes in second with 64 kilometres daily. Ontario, 88 kilometres. And up north, owning an EV doesn't make much sense. To break even, drivers in Nunavut would have to average 181 kilometres. And so there's actually a big urban-rural gap in um, the problems that arise when you transition to an electric vehicle. This economist says policies to promote electric vehicles need to take geography into account. And that's the one we're looking at right there. Cost isn't the only factor for shoppers like Christian Sloan. Definitely like the green aspect holds weight as well. Like it's nice to like be shaking it up and doing something, doing your part to change the game a little bit. As for Javid, after all that research, he drives an electric plug-in hybrid. If you're driving a lot, and depending on where you live in Canada, it can make a lot of sense. For the amount of time he spends on the road, he figures he'll save money eventually. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. A new study says independent movie theaters are in trouble in this country and is calling for more funding to keep them running. There's something different about seeing a movie in an old-style theater. The big studio tactics, they say, are hurting their business. Plus, with the U.S. weighing a TikTok ban, should Canada follow suit? How much of a security threat is it, really? Our panel breaks it down. And gearing up for a rare celestial event. This is an experience beyond all experiences. You can't prepare yourself properly for what this is like. What makes the total eclipse so special? The National breaks down the stories shaping our world. Next. Amateur singers everywhere have this man to thank, the inventor of the karaoke machine, who's passed away at the age of 100. Shigeshi Nagishi died in January. The Japanese engineer first developed the Sparkle Box in 1967, a few years before similar machines were developed. He came up with the idea after being teased for his singing voice, and he thought he'd be much better with a music track. Canada's independent cinemas are facing a financial crisis. That's according to a new study released this week. Magda Gebersalasa has more on the challenges they're facing and calls for an industry overhaul. Prepped with popcorn and pop, for this dad and his son, it's another movie night at their go-to indie cinema. We love this theatre. There's something different about seeing a movie in an old-style theatre. These are the theatres I grew up with in Toronto, and there aren't too many left. But a new report claims small theatres like this are in trouble. 60% of Canada's independent cinema owners that took part say they are operating at a loss. They can't compete with big theatres and are missing out on the buzz that comes with blockbusters, all because of practices like zoning. Just over 50% of independent cinemas in Canada have to clear a cineplex. So that means that they have to wait for a cineplex to be done showing a film before they're able to show it. The screening room. And for some, the wait can mean they're too late to really cash in. We take a movie like Air, the Matt Damon, Ben Affleck film from last year. I brought you in here to grow the basketball business. When we were finally allowed to play it at our movie theater, you could stream it for free on Amazon Prime at the same time. Ready? Another problem, clean runs. Contracts that call for a movie to be played for weeks, regardless of the turnout. For this operator of a single screen theater in his town of 4,000, it's risky business. I've done this. I've just shut the doors and locked it up and told the staff will we'll open back up when uh, the contract is done because right now we're just losing money. They want the restrictions gone as well as more funding to keep these theaters going. Cineplex says it's up to film distributors to decide where they play their films. As for what people who love their local cinemas can do in the meantime, 
Owners say, buy tickets. Magda Gebra Celeste, CBC News, Toronto. Now we go deeper into the stories shaping our world. Is TikTok really so dangerous that it needs to be banned? China-based employees routinely access this data. Concerns over data security drove the U.S. House of Representatives to vote that TikTok must be sold or prohibited. It'll affect a lot of, you know, creators, people whose livelihoods come from this app. But content creators and entrepreneurs call it an overreaction. This is The Breakdown. Well, we have two great guests on this. Christian Lloyd Precht, a political science professor at Queen's University and the Royal Military College of Canada. And Julia Angwin, a founder of Proof News and a contributing opinion writer with the New York Times who's written extensively about privacy issues. Christian, let me start with you. What do we in the public actually know about uh, the security risk that, that TikTok allegedly poses? Well, we certainly know that TikTok collects uh, a host of personal data, including your email address, your phone number, your name, um, and a host of other, obviously, uh, what you are watching, um, and that they do that on a systematic level. And so the concern is that if you're able to do this uh, over a longer period of time, you're able to capture a significant amount of intelligence, not just about your own behavior, but your circles of friends' behavior, um, uh, the understanding where you work, understanding your patterns of life, um, and that perhaps that data is then subject to aggregation by the um, Communist Party of China, so by the Chinese state, with other data that China harvests on a large scale, and that would then allow um, the Chinese state to understand enough about both your individual behavior and about mass behavior that would then be subject to potential dis or misinformation campaigns or other form of potentially um, nefarious um, threat vectors um, and uh, threat actions against individuals or societies. So, Julia, that all sounds very dire, something that the United States government says that, uh, you know, it does not want to risk on the part of Americans on TikTok. Uh, you don't feel, though, that, that, that the risks are as great as, as others do? I mean, I think that it's just worth noting that basically TikTok is collecting the exact same amount of information as every other app on your phone. And actually, in some ways, it would probably have less because you don't usually send messages, direct messages through TikTok. You don't actually usually have your friend network the same way you do on Facebook. It's actually much more about just which video you watch and how long you swipe um, on it before you go to the next one. And that is valuable information. I will tell you that my particular viewing uh, on TikTok will show them that I'm watching a lot of recipes for cheesecake. Uh, and so I don't know that it's always going to be such sensitive behavior. But as a person who cares about privacy, I do think it's important that to know that like all of these apps are unregulated and taking way more information than they need. All right, we'll get to that in a moment. But Christian, let, let's let's pick up on a point that, that Julia made. If if all she's watching on TikTok, this is what she claims anyway, is you know cooking <laughs> recipe apps. It, it sounds like she has nothing to be concerned about. What, what would you say? Yeah, so I think there's two misunderstandings here. That of course the comparison to other companies that collect and aggregate your data, um, many of these companies are subject to at least some constraints in terms of privacy legislations and some constraints also in terms of what shareholders and so forth expect from them. And the concern here is not just TikTok, but the Chinese state collecting this data over a long period of time. And if it is collecting and building a social credit system on 1.3 billion Chinese, you can assume uh, that the Communist Party of China is looking to do this for the rest of the world's population as well. And then systematically aggregating and using those data precisely to influence our societies, whether that is to influence elections, whether that is to polarize our societies. The concern is uh, that China is, uh, is, is, it's kind of like climate change. So it is a long-term strategy understanding that data is the most valuable commodity of the 21st century and the ability to understand Western societies that would then allow significant leverage in terms of influence operations. So, so Julia, when you hear that analysis, so put aside, uh, you know, the personal use that we have or don't have on TikTok, and, and for most of us, it, it's pretty innocent stuff. What about that, that bigger picture that Christian warns us about? What about the possibility that TikTok is... is you know, will work as an arm of the Chinese government to gather data about American and Canadian preferences and make it easy for a bad actor 
the Chinese government to manipulate public debate in, in our countries. I mean, I think what you're describing is exactly what the Russians did in 2016 on Facebook, right? And they didn't need to own it to do that. So I think that we have a world of social media where they are actually perfectly designed for influence operations, right? And it's not necessarily always state actors, right? It sometimes is with Russia. And you also have, you know, Twitter uh, X, which was bought by a billionaire who has his own political agenda and is using it to promote that agenda. So I think what we have is an unregulated area of speech where we're allowing all these interests to influence it. And so I'm not saying that there's no concerns about China, but what I am saying is that there are concerns across the board. And honestly, forcing TikTok to sell is likely to sell to somebody who also has a political interest. Yeah, which is what I was exactly going to ask you about, because I think the Elon Musk X Twitter example is a good one. He comes in here with a very clear agenda and takes a, a platform and disrupts it to his own ends. Why can't, Julia, a government as powerful as the U.S. government, with a few strokes of the pen, uh, protect the, 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 the data, the privacy of, of you know, U.S. citizens when it comes to any platform, no matter where it's owned? Yeah, I mean, it is, it's depressing, honestly, because, you know, we're behind every other nation. And um, we have tried, I think, got kind of close with some comprehensive privacy legislation in the last um, session of Congress, and it just couldn't get through. As you know, there's a lot of money in politics, unregulated, unrestricted corporate money allowed to be uh, contributing to politicians and to different um, and to lobbyists. And so we have these industries that are really, really profitable and in Silicon Valley, and they spend a lot of money in DC trying to make the argument that any sort of regulation is going to slow down the, the, you know, the engine of their innovation. So we're in kind of a bad situation here. Last question to each of you. I'll start, uh, Christian, with you. Um, should people get off TikTok in Canada? Uh, you know, notwithstanding what governments do, should people just delete the app? Well, I think uh, ultimately we live in a in a free and democratic society, so individuals need to make their own choices. And uh, uh, deleting the app will, of course, uh, provide sort of some protection for yourself. It won't protect society from the ability of an adversarial actor to still continue to collect lots of data on people who still have the app. Um, but uh, I think what we do need is perhaps opportunities for the government to allow citizens to make more informed decisions. You're doing this as the public broadcaster with this corporation, but perhaps there's an opportunity for states to develop, for instance, certification systems where social media and other companies that adhere to certain standards would then get a seal of certification that those standards might be auditable uh, externally. And so to have some accountability and some transparency in terms of voluntary standards that uh, uh, government establishes and that that ultimately companies could then meet for citizens to make more informed decisions about uh, the uh, apps and other media um, uh, technology that they use. And Julie, I know you're in the United States. Our audience is in Canada. But any advice to average people when it comes to being on TikTok or not being on TikTok? Well, I guess my overall advice, um, having written a book on privacy and written about it for, for years, is that um, it is great to try to take individual actions, but reality is privacy is a collective action problem, right? We're all less safe when all of our data is available everywhere and can be used against us in any way, right? So I think we, I, I do encourage people to try to use the privacy settings on all of their apps, but ultimately we need collective solutions. We need comprehensive privacy legislation to protect all of us. Julie Angwin, Christian Loiprecht, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Coming up, excitement is building among stargazers with only weeks to go before a total solar eclipse. Mostly we have to go all the way around the world and back to see these things. This is a gift coming to us. Andrew Chang breaks down why for most it could be a once in a lifetime chance. That's next. Find out how to make the most of an incredibly rare spectacle in the heavens. You cannot prepare yourself for how intensely cosmic it is. A total solar eclipse can blow your mind. Whoa, I 
never thought I'd see that. We'll tell you about the best vantage points on the continent. Now the clips comes to North America on Monday, April 8th. Here's Andrew Chang to break down what will make it a truly wondrous occasion. Total solar eclipses happen all the time, once every 18 months or so on average. In theory, you could see dozens of them in your lifetime, but you won't. The one coming up on April 8th may very well be the only one you will ever experience, if you're lucky, and I'm going to explain why. This is an experience beyond all experiences. You can't prepare yourself properly for what this is like. I've been told to see a total solar eclipse is a defining moment in one's life. The bright sky gives way to a creeping darkness. The ambient light changes, the air gets colder, and the moon slow glides into place. These brilliant beads of light shimmer and disappear one by one until there's nothing left but that dancing glow of the sun's corona, its atmosphere, giving this halo to the moon. The spiky streamers and long brushes and these shapes that you can't even describe come shooting off the surface of the sun but the sun's rays completely blocked. You cannot prepare yourself for how intensely cosmic it is to stand in the shadow of the moon and observe the corona. So that lead up, those last 15, 20 minutes leading up to the shadow of the moon arriving on top of your head and transforming your environment. It is a peak experience. It was a peak experience in my life. Whoa! In some cultures, there are entire rituals devoted to solar eclipses, and understanding what makes a total eclipse rise above the rest is a big part of its magic. Okay, so we have our sun, we have our moon, and no Earth, because you're the Earth, okay? Your camera angle that you're looking through right now represents you looking out into the sky, looking at space, and looking at the sun. So, a total solar eclipse is when the moon, which orbits the Earth, orbits you about once every month, when the moon happens to line up exactly with the sun. Which, considering the two things aren't anywhere near the same size, is sort of amazing. But your camera angle helps us explain why. In reality, the sun is about 400 times bigger than our moon, but by sheer dumb cosmic luck, it's also about 400 times farther away. So in our sky, they can appear to be the same size. I mean, that's the whole joke with that old kids in the hall head crushing skit. I pity you and I curse you. <laughs> Sorry, nothing personal, I'm apolitical. Okay, you, you, can, you can stop that. But then why don't we have total eclipses every month if that's how often the moon comes between us and the sun? Well, because the moon's orbit is not always perfectly aligned with the earth and the sun all the time at the same time. It's a bit angled. So imagine in some random month, the moon could be orbiting the earth in its off angle axis. And when it comes directly between us and the sun, it might actually be here. So it's not actually blocking the sun at all. Or maybe we only get a partial eclipse, which is when the moon passes over the sun, but never quite completely covers it up. Or sometimes because the orbit is an oval, it's not a perfect circle, meaning sometimes the moon is farther away from us than normal. It actually appears smaller in the sky than the sun. We call that an annular eclipse, or maybe you've heard of the ring of fire eclipse. Same thing. But the moon casting a shadow on the earth in such a precise way so that the sun and the moon are exactly the same size in the sky and they overlap exactly one on top of the other. That only happens once every one or two years. And for you and me specifically, depending on where you live, April 8th might be even more special than that. In reality, the moon's shadow on Earth will be like the head of a pin 
at any given moment. So while we have very precise knowledge of exactly where that pinpoint will be at any given hour on April 8th, it's so small and it's moving that the odds of you ever having been in that sweet spot before are pretty slim. Because sometimes that total eclipse is over the ocean or the southern tip of Africa or slicing through Japan. For a city in what's called this path of totality, to ever find itself in that shadow cone again, on average, you'd have to wait about 375 years. Mostly we have to go all the way around the world and back to see these things. This is a gift coming to us. So to be in that 180 kilometer wide moving pinpoint as the moon's shadow cuts a swath through southern Ontario, Quebec and the Maritimes, the closer you are to that circle's center, the longer of a total eclipse you'll get to experience. Maybe as many as a few minutes if you're in the right place at the right time. And if you have clear skies, that's the real wild card and why the most dedicated eclipse chasers out there are all heading to Mexico. So I've chosen Mazatlan in Mexico. It's way down on the Pacific coast of Mexico, looking out into the Pacific Ocean. And when you look at the whole path of totality this time, it has the greatest chance of clear skies. Then as you move up into the United States and then across Canada, the chance of clouds increases as you go along. So I'm choosing Mexico simply because we have a, a very high likelihood of seeing the thing. I should be clear. If you're not in this very specific shadowy band, that means you will not see a total eclipse. You will see a partial eclipse. That's for almost all of North America. But know this, the chance to see a total eclipse anywhere is very much a limited time offer. The moon is actually constantly getting farther away from us by a few centimeters every year. Its orbit gets wider and wider. So in about a billion years, there will be no more total eclipses for anybody on Earth. Okay, so you have that billion year window. If Andrew Chang got you fired up about seeing the solar eclipse sooner, remember it does come with risks to your eyesight. Scientists warn not to look directly at the sun at any point during the eclipse. Normal sunglasses don't protect you. You can get special eyewear that will. Coming up, an elaborate disguise with a heartwarming purpose. She'd see the pointy ears, she'd see the form of a snout, she'd see that crazy fur, um, and she'd be like, oh, that's my mom, I'm a fox. The story behind the mask, next in our moment. No, this isn't a costume party. The furry mask you see there is meant to remind an orphan baby fox of her mother. Underneath the disguise is Melissa Stanley. Her team at the Richmond Wildlife Center in Virginia has been nursing the orphaned fox and doing their best to play the role of mom. And tonight, her nurturing performance makes our moment. This fox, uh, when she came to us, her eyes were starting to unseal and she never saw her mother. I didn't want her to be in the process of us feeding her and her eyes open and the first thing that she associates in her brain is the human form and food and that positive reinforcement. We've worn owl masks to feed baby owls and things of that nature. We know it works in birds. We know it works in pandas. So I was like, I need a mask, let's try this. When we're born, we connect with our mother and our father instantly by eyesight. So I put a plea out on Facebook and found a mask that I thought would work given her um, undeveloped vision. So she'd see the pointy ears, she'd see the form of a snout, she'd see that crazy fur, um, and she'd be like, oh, that's my mom, I'm a fox. Anything that we can do to try to recreate nature as, as best as we can in captivity, I mean, I wonder what the scientific evidence is of that working, but, but here's the thing. Anecdotally, it seems to be working. The kit does feed more when uh, somebody's wearing the mask nearby. And just yesterday, the kit was uh, put with some other kits at another rehabilitation center and seems to be thriving and mimicking fox-like moves. That is The National for March 15th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night, right back here for The National. Have a great Saturday.